We introduced our new series a few weeks ago, calling it Christian Living 301. And again, we're basing this series on the 12 statements made on a page in the Experiencing God workbook that we studied through months ago on Sunday nights. And those statements all have to do with how we interact with one another, how we're to get along with one another in the body of Christ, how we live with one another and treat one another. And again, that in the context of the strong people that we have that make up this church. Again, read that, strongly opinionated people that make up this church. <laughs> and statement number four is this. You can see it up here. Statement number four out of the twelve is be absolutely truthful in all you say. Now there's a tough one. So today, it is Christian Living 301, truthfulness. Why? Why is it so important to be absolutely truthful in all that we say? And is it necessary, truthfulness, as a part of the Christian life? Well, let's begin with the one in whom all things have their beginning and examine the character of God and even more deeply the nature of God as one of truth. In John chapter 14, Jesus declares, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. That's the relationship together. But the verse before that, Jesus declares, I am the way and the truth and the life. The very essence of Jesus, the very essence of God, is that of truth, the truth. The same is said of the Spirit of God as, as you can see, the Spirit of truth. The Greek term for truth is aletheia meaning truth in its deepest core or reality or sincerity. So I, I just had to throw that in there today. Uh, I love you, daughter, Aletheia. But specifically regarding God himself, we learn elsewhere that talking in the context of eternal life, Paul writes, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies promised before the ages began. And so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled the refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. So we've got to begin by understanding the nature of God. And obviously the nature of God is one of truth. It's, it's His nature. It's who He is. It's His character. It's what He does and how He acts. When He speaks truth, when He speaks, truth always emanates from His voice. Even Balaam, if you remember Balaam, he was a prophet of the Old Testament and he was paid to execute curses upon the people of Israel. And even he was forced to speak truth when he said instead, in Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie. And Jesus, in testifying to whom it was that sent him to this earth, says of the sender, and in him... There is no falsehood. So we have to understand that truth begins with God. And when we are trying to establish our moral compass, when we're trying to develop a biblical worldview at which we look at the world through our lens of the Bible, that guides us in how we should treat one another and live with one another, we've got to understand that God demands honesty from His people. Reaching back all the way to the law of Moses, the commandments, those, those big ten, what's number nine? It says, you shall not bear false witness 
against your neighbor. Did you know that Scripture describes the interdependent relationship between truth and righteousness and between falsehood and unrighteousness? For example, Paul talks in Romans chapter 2 about those, as you can see up here, who do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. And for them there will be wrath and fury. But notice the contrast to the truth here is not falsehood, it's unrighteousness. And nowhere is that made more clear than in Jesus' indictment of the Pharisees for their rejecting of the truth. It's there that Jesus says, from John 8, 31, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And those that he was debating with responded by saying, well, how, how can you say we'll be set free? We've never been enslaved to anyone. A curious statement by those who were from Israel. And then they started debating who the Pharisees belonged to. And Jesus says in John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil. And you will do as your father desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. And notice, he does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father is of lies. So get this, church. As equally... As truth is tied with the nature and character of God, falsehood is as equally tied to the nature and character of Satan, the devil. So in answering the question we began with, why? Why is it absolutely necessary to be truthful in all that we say? We can begin by answering the question by saying these truths. Because truthfulness is righteousness and falsehood is unrighteousness. Truthfulness is reflective of the nature and character of God, and falsehood is reflective of the nature and character of Satan. And the pattern of life, the pattern of our lives, is reflective of whom we belong to. Do you understand that? If our lives are marked by deceit and doublespeak and dishonesty, then we're revealing that we belong to the father of lies more than we belong to him who is truth. We must place a premium on truthfulness because others are going to come to know us as people of honesty and integrity which mirror the image of God or as something other than that. I want to show you by turning, if you will, in your Bible this morning to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, we'll start reading in verse 17 of Ephesians 4. And since we've got those red chair Bibles back underneath, if you didn't bring one, you should be able to find one there in front of you. They're back. Ephesians chapter 4, and if anybody wants to shout out a page number when they get there. What? 1244. 1244. 1244 in those red chair Bibles for Ephesians chapter 4. Again, we'll start reading in verse 17. There's not a lot of comment necessary. This is pretty clear as we just read through it. Beginning in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus these words, Now this I say, and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, 
the Gentiles stand in context to contrast to the people of faith, the people that belong to God. No longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. For they are darkened in their understanding. They're alienated from the life of God. Why? Well, because of the ignorance that is in them. Where does that come from? It's due to their hardness of heart. So this darkness, this misunderstanding, this being excluded and alienated from the life of God is due to the hardness of the heart of the person we're talking about. That's the way we should not be. Even further, verse 19, they've become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. So now we're turning the corner away from the Gentiles in the darkness and the futility of their mind to those who have learned of Christ. Assuming, verse 21, that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as, notice, the truth is in Jesus. And what's it look like? Verse 22, to put off your old self, that futility of Gentile living. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through its deceitful desires, and, in contrast, in the new life, being renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, which is created after the likeness of God. Now, what's the likeness of God? What's His nature? What's His character? It is in true righteousness and holiness. So you can see the contrast there, can you? There's this futile way of living in darkness that the Gentiles participate in, but those who have learned of Christ live according to the light and the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So after all of that, verse 25, he says, <coughs> Therefore, in light of all of that, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. I don't know if you caught that, but what Paul's talking about is in this broad contrast between darkness and light, the Gentile way and the way of God, the unrighteous way and the way of righteousness, between this great contrast, he says, in light of that, therefore, a characteristic of that new life is putting away falsehood and speaking truth to your neighbor. For we are members of one another. Being truthful in what we say marks this new way of life in Jesus Christ. And if we're talking about Christian living, Christian living 301, Christ living in and through us, it can only be characterized by truth emanating from outside, within to outside of us. Paul says elsewhere in Colossians, and you can see it up here on the screen, chapter 3, to another church, do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And the image of the creator of this new life is the image, the nature of truth. And that's why we need to speak truth, because it reveals to whom we belong and whether or not we have been born again into this new life, the Christian life. But there's one more thing worth mentioning, and that's the practical nature of truth-telling. We said this series is about the way we treat one another, how we get along in community with one another. So again, why speak truth to one another? Can we say it's also because, practically speaking, truth-telling is essential for authentic, trusted communication to occur. It's really the only thing that makes profitable communication and interaction possible. The virtue of truth-telling has always been valued, even outside of Christianity. 
The philosopher Aristotle, in, who was born in 384 B.C., believed in the value of truthfulness. Regarding his thought around virtue ethics, what are those things ethically that are virtuous in life? He included truth-telling as supreme but encompassing other virtues, like courage. Think about it. Doesn't it, at times, take courage to tell the truth? Yeah. Also, the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, born in 1724, argued that without the universal norm of truth-telling, the basis for communication among people would be in jeopardy. Get this. And a society in which truth-telling was not the norm would not be functional. Can we see that in our society today? Amen. So think about this in terms of the church and how we live together. Truth-telling builds trust. And trust is critical in a community of individuals trying to live out life together with one another. In contrast, let's say that every one of us just started to lie to one another. Just, just started telling lies all the time. How would we ever find a place to land? How would we ever be able to trust anyone when we, when we don't know who's telling us the truth or who's lying, how would we ever gain solid, actionable advice from anyone? How do we know who is the deceiver or who is the honest person? Maybe, maybe that's what Paul's getting at in that Ephesians 4, verse 25, where he tags that, put away falsehood, speak truth to your neighbor, for we're members of one another. You see that? That's kind of an interesting tagline, is it? We're members of one another. And that's why truth-telling is necessary, because it builds unity. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to bludgeon one another with the truth, does it? Sense tells us that discreetness, love, and consideration must temper our truth at times. Okay? Amen. Someone has written these words. One reason that truth is rejected is the inappropriate way in which it's sometimes packaged. When truth comes bundled with harsh tones of judgment, criticism, and condemnation, it can cause the recipient to put up a wall of defense as a safeguard against the attack. But when truth comes wrapped in patience, tenderness, and love, it is much easier to receive. You and I will both admit that it is not always easy to be honest. Sometimes we must combine the virtue of truth-telling with courage. But though not easy, it is always the clearest and most noble choice. For when we lie, most often when we lie, for the purposes of self-preservation or self-glorification, we are immediately destroying the foundation for an effective, trusted communication between us and others and distorting the image of God, the God of truth, who is supposed to be living in us. So consider, the next time you're tempted to lie, remember from Proverbs 12, that lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. But those who act faithfully are His delight. Let's pray.